we should be live now um if all things being being great uh but anyone anyways, just live on my um, side oh i got one of the emojis yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> emoji yeah i don't get I got the reaction okay sorry okay go on yeah sure um how do these even start but anyways for anyone listening welcome to another wonderful episode of everything outside code where we talk about you know the boring bits but rather i would say the really important bits about shipping software that isn't just slapping your keyboard till something good comes out of the code and today we have a very wonderful guest uh, all the way from the freezing north we have benedicta with us today thank you for having me and uh, i don't know what i yeah. can contribute i just slapped a keyboard and saying something <laughs> good happened <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I guess that's what we all did first, and then we moved on to like <laughs> we move on. We to did. More we moved on to like better ways of doing it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, for anyone listening, uh, if you're on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button somewhere. I don't know where it is, so the channel grows and other people can find uh, find what we talk about. But today we're going to be talking about all things developer relations. So if you're building a developer product or a SaaS product that has some developer features, I think you should be listening to, to this now. Um, so over to you, Queen. Um, I think we should start with some history, right? How did you get here to today, to 2024, career-wise, or any other like story you Do want to share with us? A couple of hours? <laughs> <laughs> you can give us well, the, the 10 I'll minutes give you the abbreviated uh, version. So we could probably do like a, the version where how I became queen. Uh, and that was during the uh, pandemic times where we'd started doing some live streams together with some friends. Um, and then Ola, my partner in business and life and the father of my child, uh, came up with this concept that it would be cool if we were pirates and I was the queen. Doesn't really match, but it's like a fun mismatch match. But then it turns out that actually... Uh, way back when, the pirates were usually sanctioned by the queen. I think it was Queen Victoria. We need Ula for all of this pirate history lessons. But um, they yeah. would actually have like these letters that said that they were allowed to be pirates by the queen. Um, and they were like a part of the the defense. But anyway, that that is a lot about pirates. And there's a lot of fun things about pirates because we think about them just as like you know, looters and they would steal and stuff, but they also kind of had their own um, societal order. Like they they kind of broke out of the the ways things were done and the hierarchy of, um, of the most societies at the time and like built their own kind of thing off to the side. So anyway, he came up with the concept partly also because I am not the best uh, listener. I talk a lot. I get very energized. And uh, he thought giving me the persona as the queen kind of gave me also permissions to be a little bit more of that, like lean into those, the good parts, I guess, of that, um, or like lean into the... Mm -hmm. I had a colleague that said that like every good quality you have is also your bad quality. So like my good quality of yeah. getting energy, like getting uh, finding a lot of joy in what I'm doing and like being energized by it and then can also come across as a little like too much. But if you're introduced mm -hmm. as the queen, like you're allowed to do pretty much whatever you want. And if you're late, which is also something I often am because I do try to squeeze too much into the day. Um, you can say, as they said in the Princess Diary, that a queen is never late. Everybody else is just mm -hmm. early. Um, so that yeah. kind of came about during the pandemic and where we were leaning at that time where we were very much into Gatsby. So it became a show about um, Gatsby where we looked at how to create or how to do something with Gatsby in every stream. So we were like, okay, what if we mm -hmm. need what if we need to show when we are live on YouTube, then how could we do that in Gatsby? And then after a while, we would also start in interviewing Gatsby employees. We had a lot of the Gatsby engineers on our show talking about Gatsby or showing us how to use new, use new features of Gatsby. And that's kind of how the whole pirate queen thing came about. Uh, so that's, mm -hmm. well, I can manage to talk a lot about that even. So that's the, yeah. the story about the queen. We've always been independent, but we realized a lot of people thought that I was the official DevRel 
for outside for outside no for Gatsby. I am now the official dev uh, rel for Outsetta, but that kind of yeah. pushed me towards like maybe there is something in this where we can keep doing these things and do them as like more in a dev rel capacity instead of just in our you know spare time as fun projects, but still keep it fun, but hopefully also make um, some money off of doing yeah. some of the similar activities. But to go all yeah. the way back, back, I have a mother who was a developer and later CTO for hire. She gave me my first computer, uh, opened the terminal and said, do not write this because you will crash your whole, wipe your whole computer. I've been terrified of terminals ever since and leaned into the UI of things because I was like, I don't want to delete my whole computer. Um, but now I'm getting friendlier with the terminal. And then my Norwegian teacher, in 10th grade, I was about 13, um, had been to some kind of, you know, uh, later education for teachers where he came back and he told me and some of the other girls, like, you really want to do this elective that we're going to start giving, which is a HTML plus CSS course. And um, I guess that senior, no, junior high would be the American equivalent. Um, so he's actually the person my mom like never really introduced me to coding. She just kind of gave me a computer and was like, have at it. But yeah. he was the one who was like, you know, you can actually learn something and we're going to teach HTML and CSS. So that's how I got into that. And then for a school play in 2000 at my senior high school, I got to be in charge of their website. And that's where I did my first JavaScript which was a gallery where you could flip through, you know, the pages like a typical gallery we did in those days. And I spent, yeah. and somewhere up here, I have the book that like taught me this. And I have this idea that I will bring that book back to life and do videos where I like teach myself to code again with that book. Yeah. But I digress. I did this gallery thing and I spent three days, I kid you not, to try to figure out a bug and my mom came and helped because she'd also been taking these JavaScript lessons at this time or like courses at this time. And we were like, look mm -hmm. through it and we looked through it. And it turns out I had spelled height wrong at one point. Yeah. yeah. Used I, I am before the E. Yes. And I am dyslectic. So like that, I am very happy about the code editors these days. Otherwise, my coding would... Uh, be much worse. Uh, I still, yeah. that is still though my go-to problem. Like I did a stream with Framer the other day and I wrote variant wrong. Like, but yeah. anyway, and that took me all the way into university where I did a um, master's in computer science. Mm -hmm. And then I worked the year as a consultant and then I've been paying my way as a contractor and doing joyful side projects on the side all, all along yeah. the way. Yeah. That's, that's that's amazing, and it's interesting to hear. Um, I think the, the most the more interesting bit was not being the official DevRel person for Gatsby, but everyone else thought so. Is that the statement of like the impact you made or your style of working? How did that come about to be? Because I think that that's something a lot of companies would really want to have folks we call champions of some sort mm -hmm. that really champion the product and they use it and they try it and they. They use it in a more natural tone rather than having like very curated strategy backed um content being created out of it so how did you how did all that come about did you even have a strategy to that or you just like created stuff <laughs> i think at that time we created stuff we when we moved into kind of more this official pirate style show we had an idea mm -hmm. that we wanted to become gatsby experts so that we could potentially sell services around Gatsby. And one of the things I really enjoyed with Gatsby were kind of the plugin ecosystem. And I thought at that time, or we kind of bet at that time that it would evolve in a similar way as the Word WordPress ecosystem, so that there would be like a space for us to maybe sell plugins, but then also help companies with their official mm -hmm. plugins for Gatsby. And that bet did not work out because Gatsby <laughs> is not, you know, kind of is not where it could have been. Um, so we kind of looked at it as we wanting to be independent and having opinions that were outside of the company. So I never tried to become mm -hmm. an official part of the, of the team. But at the time, while we were kind of in the beginnings of this, they, they had a shift where 
I don't remember the timeline that's exactly, but at some point they kind of didn't have their own DevRels. There were some, they had some people leave and then they didn't get somebody in. And so I think in that, that kind of period, because we were the only ones like talking about mm -hmm. Gatsby kind of on Twitter and on YouTube, people then just assumed that I was paid by Gatsby. Uh, and that's kind of what I've realized that when you get this enthusiastic about something, people mm -hmm. assume that you are paid. So I think at some time, at some point, my my thinking shifted where it's like, well, if everybody assumes I'm paid anyway, maybe I should just get paid. You should get paid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I was like, oh, we're so independent. Like we, you know, we talk from our own free mind. Like we're not funded by Gatsby. Yeah. And that is really important because then people know that you know, what we say uh, you know, is correct, or like we we will we'll yeah. also say negative things because we are not kind of paid mm -hmm. by them. But what I realized is that, and also being in Norway, like I didn't really have access to the developer event or the developer advocate community. So I didn't really realize how these things worked or like how Devfluencer or Techfluencer, like how, how all of that worked. Mm -hmm. But while doing this, we realized, or I realized at least that people assume you're paid anyway. So mm -hmm. like trying to like keep that independence started well, I'll still yeah. keep my independence because I, you know, that that's just me. Um, but and when you do things live as well, like if things doesn't work out, like you gotta talk about it, even if it's bad. Like so, we yeah. even if we get paid, like we we won't gloss over the, you know, the quirky parts or the the you know the the worst or the things that aren't yeah. working. But yeah, so sometimes I think in my mind I was just like, you know, if everybody just assumes that, like why not try to make services around yeah. this so that we can get paid and keep on doing what we 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 love which um which is building stuff and and being more i would say more of a like creator family we just love creating yeah. things and being like what can we make can we make this and then go about trying to make it and then we could make it mm -hmm. with your service like at this point you know i'm 40 uh, which is like you know, when you ask, like, tell me your story to ask people, who are, you know, who are 40, like you'll, you'll get hours <laughs> of history. <laughs> but I just glossed yeah. over like 10 or 15 years there. But um, well, what was my point? Um, yeah, at this point, yeah, like I'm with not... the experience I have, it doesn't really matter to me that much. You know what database we're using, like I can use any yeah. of them. So if we want to create something, we could get one of the services that offer database in as a sponsor, or um, we mm -hmm. can, you know, do kind of DevRel services for them and build the thing that I really want to build without having to make it into a business. Um, so we yeah. call that sponsored build in public projects. Huh. That's interesting. So just before you said this, the first the thought I had was we've talked about like you know creating indie content like content independently you've always been independent helping teams how does all that and i get this a lot from folks as well especially folks in devrel that want to do some you know developer relations consulting of some sort because they maybe like a product but they feel they could contribute in other ways that isn't what they do primarily for work so with mm -hmm. you it seems like this is what you do so how does it work how do you do this in general, what's, I think we could start from like, what's the value proposition to these folks or these people when you speak with them or when you approach someone or you see a product you want to work with, how do you come at it? Uh, so for the sponsor build in, in the sponsored build in public project that we've done that was kind of successful is Prune Your Follows, which was a product to um, help you unfollow people on Twitter. It is a little in, bit in hiatus because Twitter changed their APIs. And that was also well, like one of the mm -hmm. reasons I didn't want to make this as an indie creator and like try to make money off of it because I know that relying on a third party like the Twitter API would, <laughs> yeah. would be, you know, uh, wouldn't really work. But how we pitched Seda at the time, which is the, the company that sponsored that build, was that we will use your product as an end user would. So you will get honest feedback from us on what is mm -hmm. working and what is not working. So we went at it saying that we will use your documentation. We will use your SDKs. We will use whatever you have mm -hmm. that is publicly available. And then we will only ask you if we're stuck. 
So we will try to get as far yeah. as we can with what you have. So you will get honest feedback on the thing from us while we're building something and we're building something that's going to go to production. So it's not like a hello world tutorial where everything just works mm. perfectly, right? It always works perfectly because yeah. you're not really a lot of that like tutorial and demo content. I see you're not, you're not hitting on any of the edge cases. You're not, it's yeah. just the path all the way. But when like we have this vision, like I wanted to make this app, I want to make these features and I'm going to make mm -hmm. them no matter what, then I'm going to be pushing kind of your documentation and your SDKs the way yeah. I want or like for what I need, not just for a demo that that is like very contained. Um, so that is yeah. what that was the one part uh, of the value proposition. And and we kind of like I've been toying with with ideas. So we're still in the early phases of this, right, for people listening. Mm -hmm. So we're toying with what to call things. But one thing we'd like to call that side of it is um, professional early adopter, like as a service. Yeah. Like I now it's like <laughs> a professional <laughs> early adopter where uh, we will test out and just like use it as mm -hmm. a new person would. Um, so that yeah. was one side of the value proposition. And then the other side is that we'll build this in public. And it's hard to promise exactly what they will get from that because that is then we're yeah. going more to the marketing branding side of things where I will tweet while I work. I will make little videos as I work, as things come up. Like I see, mm -hmm. so for instance, with Seda, like we've, I, I was really enamored with that, how they have um, fussy search out of the box because I was like, okay, we need to search. Like, how can we search? And then I looked at their search documentation and being dyslexic, you know, I need the fussy search because I don't spell. We've gone over that already. I can't spell. So then I created just like a little set of like, now they would be YouTube shorts, but this was just little videos on, on Twitter. And uh, like showing like, oh, you can do, you get fussy search out of the box and this is how you do it. And I made that kind yeah. of the same thing. I figured it out the day after, which like gives you that kind of energy where it's like, oh, I just figured this out. I want to share it. Um, and then we did that continuously. And then after a while, people could also start using the app. Because in this case, we went all the way to production. And then the app ended yeah. up in a crunch and got featured uh, in an article there. Um, so, but we can't promise that, right? We can't promise that every project yeah. we do will become featured in TechCrunch, but like by continuously sharing uh, what you're doing while you build something, you kind of increase that kind of luck surface. Um, yeah. But I would say like real tangible benefit is that we really like battle test your your documentation and, and even your product. Like we'll find yeah. bugs you might not have seen mm -hmm. and we'll report them in the back channels so that you can fix them mm -hmm. <laughs> before the next person yeah. hits them. Um, and then the like less tangible, but also very fun aspect is that um, yeah, is that like con on the spur content where you're we're working on something yeah. and you get inspired and you make it and that has like a little bit different quality to it than mm -hmm. than the um, produ well produced kind of tutorial step by step type um, content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really valuable proposition, even though it's very hard to handle attribution with that. And I say this because yes. recently I was speaking to a partner. <laughs> I was speaking to a partner of ours at, at Hack Mama, and they have a similar strategy. They are thinking of how can they create content that's one level deeper, right? So they have the content that drives general awareness or the, it's not getting started, but it just doesn't have that depth, you know, to mm -hmm. drive conversion and also to reach the folks that could be champions in the organizations they are trying to sell into, right? So you want to reach maybe not just regular engineers, but senior engineers, because everyone mm -hmm. is focused on revenue at the moment. So they want to reach senior mm -hmm. engineers, they want to reach lead engineers, engineering managers even, and eventually like all the way up to like a CTO. So what content appeals to these folks? They figured out, okay, we need to create content that's deeper, that talks about, or that uses mostly just the modes of the product, right? The modes and some of like the hidden mm -hmm. edge cases and the features. Mm -hmm. Like you talked about fuzzy search with, with Zeta. Um, that's probably just one kind of, um, I would say, one feature they have. And it could expand to like some other, um, I would say, deeper features they have. So yeah, that's a very good value yeah, proposition. And I, and I think when you make something real that you're actually putting into production like we did, and, and not every project we do will need to do that. Like we are trying now to make packages where 
you know, we we can make smaller demos and we'll do those live. And while we make, you know, mm -hmm. from those live sessions when we're building it, we'll maybe have engineers from your organization help us. And from that, we can get clips and content that, you know, you can take that live stream with your engineer yeah. who's like explaining to us how to do something. Then we can clip that engineer talking about something that they are, you know, they know really, really well. Like they might have built this mm -hmm. feature. And that's how you can get that that in-depth content without it coming out of the mouth of somebody that don't truly understand it. Like we can then yeah. get help from the person that truly understand it. And what we experience with Gatsby is that when we have engineers on our crazy show, like a lot of people like it's like this is just like insane with our setup. Like I wear a crown, my partner wear a bicorn hat. Like there, there's lots of like craziness in a way but it relaxes people and we've seen that the Gatsby engineers that came on like very fast relaxed and and could like get in like be themselves and mm -hmm. focus on the engineering kind of I wouldn't say art but the engineering yeah you know, the engineering art behind yeah. whatever we were working on and they understand it deeply so when I then mm -hmm. code it and ask them questions like but how does this work they just yeah. off the cuff can tell me how it work and they just use their own words. But if you ask them yeah. to create the presentation, they're going to take it and make it like either, you know, maybe beginner friendly or uh, more like bland so that like every, you know, it's more of a general statement because engineers love to make things general when they prepare. At least I do as yeah. well. Like if I'm going to make a presentation, I'm often... I often end up being too general that it's not interesting mm -hmm. for the people listening. But if you're sitting there and I'm coding something out and then, and I ask you a specific question about this feature, like how does it work behind the be, behind the scenes or, mm -hmm. you know, something, then they will tell me and they will relate it to that exact example. But you will get the general mm -hmm. kind of concept behind it. Yeah. And we haven't done that yet, but that is what we really want to do. We want to kind of take what we did mm -hmm. for SETA, but marry it with live streams where we get the engineers or the engineering founder on the stream to like help us build it out as well. And then clip that into these little shareable clips that we see around the internet now where it's not, the, the end goal isn't to get like 500 people to view the stream because that will not happen. But like through that stream, mm -hmm. we will get access to, to that kind of more off the cuff, deep, interesting engineering content. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that that is uh, that is our bet right now that people would want yeah. that, but yeah, we need to figure out how to attribute it, like like you yeah. said. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I when I speak to it, a lot of founders, especially early stage founders, that's the one question they have is they know this works, but they need to mm -hmm. be able to prove it. But to mm -hmm. either early board members they have or to their co-founders, a lot of mm -hmm. times it's their co-founders they need to prove it to them. Mm. This strategy works. And to do that, they need to show some numbers. Or, and, and also because it's not coming from their personal experience, they are mm -hmm. leaning on someone else that they have to pay mm -hmm. some amount of money to. Mm -hmm. They just want to see the numbers. And it's it's yeah. pretty difficult to, to attribute. They just need to trust. Uh, I, I know one way we've done this is to reduce the risk um, as much as possible. So instead of having like three month or six month mm -hmm. engagement with them, it's like, mm -hmm. hey, let's try this for a month. Let's try one yeah. very little piece of this, see how it works. It's thoroughly scoped. The outcomes are scoped. And we don't mm -hmm. know what we're going to get, but at least we know the process is going to be pristine. And then we see yeah. what we get. Then we can extrapolate from that and see, you know, what the six month or one year engagement will bring. Yeah. I guess th yeah, this also that... brings me to like, oh, go on. Yeah, that, that is a good point because we've been trying to sell this as something we do. Maybe we do this stream like every other week for a long time because mm -hmm. then you can fill up the time in between with content. But we just had this mm -hmm. realization while we were brainstorming yesterday that maybe it should be a week. Like we can build an app in a week. So we'll build off stream and then we'll build on stream every day. And depending on what the organization wants, we can, you know, they can come on three of those days or two of those days or one of those days, but we'll do then yeah. five streams in one week. So you kind of wrap up the whole project in one week. Then the next week you can, we can create all of the content, but then that content can be dripped out 
And we see that yeah. we can get between like seven and 15 clips from every stream. So then you would have content for the next quarter. And then you could do yeah. it again instead of having mm -hmm. that commitment of showing up to stream because people are scared of coming on streams. You know, so I don't want the engineers to be like scared of this for like months and months at the time. You know, if they yeah. come on every day for a week, by the end of that week, they're mm -hmm. going to be pros, right? And it's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. So that is kind of how we're trying to to package it now. Like we will do, mm -hmm. we'll we'll create an application or a web app with you and your technology in a week, and then you will have a ton of content to to drip yeah. out uh, that will actually we hope then land with the more senior crowd because we will not shy away from the edge cases and the problems and the, and I think, as you said, people with the purchasing power or the engineers with purchasing powers in organizations, I feel like they will often want to see the edge cases. Like they want to know what they're getting themselves into. And I think a lot of yeah. marketing founders will be like, well, we shouldn't show, like we should hide like where we're not good. But I think yeah. a lot of like engineering buyers, they want to know where the edges are because then they can plan for those and they can trust mm -hmm. you more because they, yeah. you know, you've been upfront with like, where do we shine? Where do we not shine? And I, you've seen it, seen somebody else work through those problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. I've, I've actually seen organizations that lose deals just because they didn't factor in the objections that engineers will have when they test the product. They're not selling to engineers primarily. The buyer is a CTO who doesn't really matter in like the day-to-day -day of the engineering. But some lead engineer somewhere, they're going to be the ones to test the product. They're going to implement this. And they have this edge case that isn't covered. And the sales team or whoever is trying to sell this had, you know, try as much as possible to cover it and, you know, put it away. This engineer finds out that, you know, it doesn't meet the requirements. They're like, no. We can't, we can't buy this, but sharing these upfront with them to say, Hey, here's our strengths. Here are, here are our weaknesses as well, but we're working on them. In fact, we would love to work with you on these weaknesses, right? We want to collaborate with you to make them better. We have these things in the works. Um, let's, let's see what we can do, but mm -hmm. here are our strengths, here are our modes, here are the reasons why we are better than this other product. I feel like that transparency also helps and that's something a lot of teams i think do not real they don't realize yet at least from from what i've seen i think it like you lose trust very fast because if you go in and yeah. you're like this is going to solve all your problems and then then it doesn't solve this one mm -hmm. edge case and you might never want to solve for that edge case because like you said some might be a weakness that you want to prove upon with your with your customers and some might be just like this is outside the boundary of what we are offering like you would need to get another tool or you need another product and then yeah. trying to like fudge that so you don't realize you need a third product until like long mm -hmm. into the process then mm -hmm. then i i you know you lose a little bit of trust and and especially from engineers because we yeah. um, are often very literal, right? And if we're going to be in like the broad, like we're going to paint with broad strokes here. There are yeah. some traits and not all engineers are the same, but there are like some broad, broad, um, broad brushes, strengths, whatever we call them. Uh, strokes, broad strokes is what I said, um, that we are pretty like literal. And if you, and if you haven't said it, you've kind of hidden it. You know, we, we yeah. don't like it if it's, you know, that kind of sales speak speak or marketing speak um, might like, yeah, might yeah. not be a positive. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, we don't want to showcase like how bad your tool is. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, but we'll show how to work through things. And also like one yeah. of the things that I think is really important is showcasing. And that's what we did a lot with Gatsby, which might have contributed to some of that success is that I always think about how does this product want to be used or this framework want to be used? Used Like if you're using WordPress, mm -hmm. learn about WordPress's way of doing things. Because if you try to impose mm -hmm. your mental model, your architecture onto WordPress in the wrong way, it's going to end mm -hmm. up like really bad, right? And the same thing with Gatsby yeah. or Astro or Next or any of these frameworks or then tools, you know, if you're going to use Postgres, like figure out how are the, you know, the common and best ways to use Postgres. There, There's content around that and you want to get mm -hmm. into that mindset. And 
if you can showcase like that, then people aren't going to be hitting a lot of those um, yeah. those problems or those hurdles because if they don't bring their like mental model into it and try to like impose it on your product, um, mm -hmm. then they're going to have a better experience. So trying to yeah. kind of showcase like how, and I always try to, and I visualize it like that. Like, I'm like, how does, how does Gatsby want to be used? Like, you know what, like yeah. how, yeah. I always like try to figure out like, yeah, the way that the product or yeah framework it was intended to be used mm. um and that comes a little bit from experience having worked or used multiple languages and multiple frameworks um and not trying to be like oh this way i learned to do things in gatsby is the way i'm gonna like yeah. that mental model is the one i'm gonna put on every framework on moving forward yeah. yeah yeah that's right um speaking of like the business side of things a bit more yeah. on the business side I How keep going through the code. I'm good. You're <laughs> getting us, getting us back on track. Yeah, um, I'm trying to find out how do you find customers, right? Um, you're based in Norway. Are there um, teams, software teams that are looking for help with developer relations? Do you go like on a broader search? Do you go as far as like Australia, or, like New Zealand, to look for like folks that could need some help with your services? Or how do you generate these clients? How do you find them? Well, that is a, that is a nut we're trying to crack. <laughs> but how we've okay. found them so far is uh, through networking on social media and also definitely mm -hmm. through speaking. So I am planning on doing another speaking kind of circuit uh, in the fall, I hope. Just need to come up with some good... Um, good talks to float around but yeah. you know when we were doing the Gatsby work like I would speak on Gatsby I would speak on the virtual conferences and the physical conferences and I mm -hmm. absolutely think that the physical conferences is where you get the connections where you can later then pitch something mm -hmm. um, that is well if you have something that is very like small and contained and 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 stuff you can definitely end up selling yeah. people on that but we've seen like the larger things like a building public project we've had more luck with people we've had we've spent time with on com in conferences um, mm -hmm. or meetups or any like we've had relations with and they like they they trust and like us um but that is not like super scalable <laughs> <laughs> but being a present you know being a press a presence on on twitter and now probably more linkedin that i I need to get more into LinkedIn, but like Twitter is where I've kind of lived. Um, but then mm -hmm. also there are quite a lot of private slacks and private discords um, that are also spaces that you can be invited into or you can find and and kind of foster those relationships over um, a long period of time. Yeah. yeah. And then I also of, heard of those private slacks. Sorry, I, I just wanted to mention that I've heard of those private slacks and private discords where it's like, someone mentions it's like hey you should be in this slack i'll get you an invite that's mm -hmm. where it's at and you go in there yeah. and it's like maybe two, 200 people or like 150 people not saying much but everyone is like yeah opportunities come out of here you find like collaborations here and drive new mm -hmm. business from here and i'm like where's this like cult <laughs> of like very few people in one place have you had an experience with that how was like how was that being in like these slacks or these discords have you been in any yeah so time? when i came out now where we're, we're um kind of newly re released that service where we want to do live streams with founders uh, or engineers turn founders which who we i think we think are like the our best persona um and we will live stream with them and get them to talk about their passion and i tweeted mm -hmm. about that and somebody was interested and we've had some initial calls like i don't know if if we'll go all the way but like we've had some initial calls and that came from somebody i think has listened to a podcast i've been a part of called slow and steady where we just talk about our life and progress on our indie hacking endeavors yeah. um and also is a part of a community uh, that i'm a part of so mm -hmm. i just tweeted this id and then he feels like he knows me and we've also met mm -hmm. at a conference so then he was like, yeah, we want that. And he gives, you know, he will probably give 
us more of a, ben a benefit of the doubt. I wouldn't say benefit of the doubt, but like he knows that when I say something, I mean it. And like he, he, yeah. like he trusts me, uh, not in like a shady way, but it's like he, he <laughs> knows who I am. So when I say like I want to do yeah. something like this, you know, would that be interesting for an engineering founder out there? He is already in what we call like a warm lead, right? There's somebody who yeah. already knows and trusts me. And it's at that point, it's much easier um, to to move mm -hmm. forward. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's called. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think like now what you're doing now with uh, and the way I also want to get more people into these live streams and continuous um, continuous clips from live streams and all of that is that it's something called and this sounds super shady, but it's called parasocial relationships. And it's a it's a okay. real thing where if you've listened to somebody over time you feel like mm -hmm. you know them, even if you haven't met them. And that is a way to kind of replicate yeah. that that thing that you would have gotten from meeting at a conference. You know, like you meet somebody at a conference, they actually know, they feel like they know you. So when you reach out later, they have a, you know, a face and a person connected to it. But if you show up in somebody's air, basically, <laughs> again and again yeah. and again and again, yeah. you yeah. end up having a similar, uh, similar, thing happen where they feel like they know you and it's called parasocial relationships and it's been proven from like television like if you watch a television show and you meet that person you feel like you meet you know you know that person but then you often feel like you know that character but yeah. what we are doing where we're just showing up as ourselves as real human mm -hmm. beings with our flaws and everything and, yeah. and our strengths our strengths and our flaws uh, and we keep showing up consistently then people will feel like they know you and and mm -hmm. and then you know if they like you they trust you or trust and like you then they might yeah. potentially want to do business with you um and yeah. you i think you noticed that a little bit when we i'm not, not the first time we met in person but i've had somebody i did a podcast yesterday and he's like yes i feel like yeah. i know you because he's been watching our streams you know yeah. our daughter has come home from school and like i'm laughing and then ola says something and like we are ourselves yeah. and then when i showed up to that podcast it it was just like a we just kept on having a conversation yeah. instead of it being like hey I like I'm hey. <laughs> yeah. like, you know it's nice uh, to meet you yeah but the funny yeah. thing about it is that we don't really know anything like I didn't know what country he yeah. was in he didn't know what country I was in but True. like he'd seen the stream so he felt like he knew yeah. me and we could like mm -hmm. pick up a conversation much more easily so yeah, parasocial yeah. relationships it's a super interesting um concept and and something that I think um we like we could do better in in devrel mm -hmm. but from so they're not devrel right but from the from the founders or the lead engineers who are building the thing like i yeah. would like if i could hear from them consistently i would trust the product more because those are the yeah. ones building it um yeah yeah that's right also also in marketing i think just it helps them stay top of mind i buy brands that i remember i buy products that i remember i hire people i remember i talk mm -hmm. to people that i remember i recommend people that i remember right and seeing them someplace um somewhere all the time even though i do not engage in some form but just having them passively at the back of my mind one day they're ready to, like i'm ready to mm -hmm. be sold to and i don't yeah. even know that i've been you know the sale had been reinforced a couple of years ago, but I'm just buying now. Um, mm -hmm. I was I was saying to someone, I was saying to someone at Hack Mama today that a, a prospect we're speaking to now that if we if we sort of run the numbers, we started the sale two years ago, but we just didn't know it, right? We're just yeah, going to close the sale. That is definitely, <laughs> yeah. And I've done too many things in my life, and and that often when I'm kind of done with it, that's when people remember. Yeah. So we did we did iPhone apps. And then when I hadn't been doing iPhone apps for mm -hmm. like the last year, that's when I had people reach out to me. Can you make an iPhone app for my company? And I was yeah. like, well, now I, now I make web apps like no. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so that is also I feel, you know, and I've had since we kind of accidentally came kind of into this this role role in a way 
but mm -hmm. I feel like now we really need to lean into the live aspects and kind of become the live, you know, somebody people, people remember when it comes to live content, but mm -hmm. not necessarily for kind of that, like lots of viewers, but like live content that yeah. then will translate into clips and things, but also then yeah. creative uh, demos, you know, that we mm -hmm. build real demos that can even be deployed. Yeah. Uh, because then you, you you need that they call it the Rolodex moment, you know, when somebody then says like, oh, we should go a little further, like we should make a demo that showcases more, you know, oh, you know, Queen Ray, or you know, we should yeah. get more like raw content and real content, or you know, that kind. Yeah. Of, we need to get our engineers out there. Okay, who can help our engineers shine? Well, Queen Ray can do that, um, and we haven't yeah. nailed it yet because I need we need to really nail these offerings so that exactly as you say two years down the mm -hmm. down the line somebody's like ding ding that is yeah. the pirates <laughs> or like that queen ray and her pirates yeah. like that's what they do um, but then you have to stick to it for a really long time um yeah and you've been really good that's at that time. yeah at least um i've been trying um i think i think definitely it's important to recognize that a process or a path has to be in place it could be like they could be short-term outcomes, they could be really long-term outcomes. Um, I always like to think of the fact that if there was someone we're going to sell to in five years' time, or if there's someone we're going to help in three years' time, what do we do today to have them put us top of mind? So in five years, when they cannot think of anyone, or in three years, when they can't think of like any other solution, they should just think about William. Like, mm -hmm. Remember this thing from two years ago, yeah. And I saw something about it last week. I think they are the guys I need to talk to, right? Yeah. That's that's sort of like where I want to be with whatever service I'm delivering, yeah. you know, whatever and value think, we're offering. And I think that's how I got, because we kind of glossed over that, but I do work um, as a fractional developer advocate for Outsetter, which is a membership, yeah, uh, all-in-one membership what is, um, software. Like, so if you have a website... Outsetter does? Yeah. So if uh, if you have okay. a website in any uh, in any technology, really, you can add out Seta, and then you get authentication, billing, CRM, help desk, and email, um, broadcast and transactional emails and drip campaigns. Yes, um, in ones so that you can add to your site. So That's the way I got What's the site? sorry, outsetta dot com. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I got that that job because I did a little job for them showcasing how you could use it with React. Like I really wanted them to do it with Gatsby, of course. But they were like, "Yeah, we don't we don't know like what's going to happen with yeah. Gatsby," and they were, you know, right. But uh, yeah. so I was like, "Okay, well, I can do a demo for you in React then." So at that time, I was like, "Okay, I can do demos for you know." We were offering um, demos or plugins or code reviews were like the things I was trying mm -hmm. to offer at that time. Um, so I did that for them, but then we kept like showing up, I guess, in their feed, even if it was Gatsby content. And then I also kind of sent them uh, speaking opportunities. Like I was like, oh, you should be on this podcast. And like, I followed them up because I was hoping to sell them on more Gatsby services, like when Gatsby was gonna make yeah. it big. I was like keeping keeping that conversation warm. And then at some point they were, they were like, okay, we need somebody in-house that can do more with developers that understand developers more because their mm -hmm. biggest market so far accidentally became the no code community so when they originally oh. made the product it was meant to be for a uh, SaaS founders so you wanted to make a SaaS, but you didn't want to build out everything you would use yeah. etc but then at that time webflow was on it on the rise and they kind of mm -hmm. fell into like this is really really good for no code tools because they usually don't yeah. you can't you can't code your own auth in there. Like you need something like that set up. Uh, but then now we're like looking into how we can make it more known and, and interesting for developers. Um, but there I'm in, I'm in a little bit of like, what's it called? Deep waters, because what we need is, you know, better documentations like we've been <laughs> writing about. And documentation yeah. is not my strength, but I realized that we, yeah, I wouldn't say it's not my strength. It's not, but I haven't had like a bunch of experience. So I've been working doing like working on the documentation um and that kind of stuff and haven't been able mm. to do that much live streaming but then i was like what the hell i'm just gonna do both so now we're live yeah. streaming a patreon clone in framer and outset on this week actually 
That's great. So. So I'm bringing the live yeah. streaming in there too. Like I'm going to be the, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what yeah. we're going to be. Um, yeah. But... And I think live streams are, are super low effort as well. Um, this is the tenth, oh, this is 11th episode mm -hmm. of this live stream. And I thought about it in a day and I decided to just set up camera. I already have one, just use my camera and um, yeah. the mic and talk to interesting people. Yeah without like thinking about editing or how do I want to like make it look better or publish mm. it in some way. With live streams, I think you can just record. And I use StreamYard. Shout out to them yes. as well. Yes, just shout out to them. StreamYard. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, there's there's some truth to what you're saying and especially for a conversational podcast like this, you can just hit record and it, you know, if, if you have something interesting to talk about, it usually becomes an interesting stream. With coding, yeah. it's a little bit of a hit and miss, um, but you, I wouldn't say like hit and miss. We've started to learn like how to make those those interesting and also clippable mm -hmm. because that's what we realized. That's where the strength of the live stream, coding live stream comes in is the clippable thing. Because we were talking yeah. about these engineering people who have purchasing power. They are not watching one hour live streams. Um, but it's a yeah. way to get that depth that we were talking about. But we've also realized some things that, um, you know, it's just like basic things. Like you need to bump up the font size because people are watching yeah. on mobile. Uh, True. You you want and what we've started doing more and more recently it's like we often start in tl draw which is a diagramming tool and we yeah. kind of draw out and talk about what we are going to make because whenever you kind of wear off course or you hit a bug or something like that you can always come back to that plan and it's also mm -hmm. a way to kind of show the viewer what we are going to do without it being done in a tutorial, yeah. you will very often like show the end result before you go into how you're making it so that people yeah. can like see the end results in the back of their minds while you walk through. With live streaming, you don't have that because part of the fun with live streaming and the energy comes from not having built it before. I've tried that yeah. too, where you build it first and then you build it again on live stream. And mm -hmm. it, it's not the same energy. Yeah, um, It's just not. It's, it's often more real kind of raw energy than a tutorial because you're still doing it you're delivering live so you kind of get that like mm -hmm. on thing yeah but it it's i felt like it it was it was too smooth like it was a little too smooth yeah. um but yeah so there are some things and tricks and i should probably like write about this in a blog post before i forget all yeah. the things we've learned <laughs> yeah uh, but, <laughs> yeah um but yeah. what i what i do think is that the devrel community has made it this like very hard thing. Like it seems like a very hard thing to do in terms of like gear and setup. So that's what I loved what you were saying. Like you just set up a camera and a light maybe yeah. and you hit record. And most people listen, I think too. Like people won't be watching yeah. us. They will be listening to us. It doesn't really matter like how amazing your setup is and that you have LED lights in the back and you have this like, you know, Sony A something that will blur your background yeah. but make you look good. And yeah. I feel like the the prof professionalization of kind of video DevRel or like live streaming DevRels have made it seem like it's this like insurmountable mountain where you have to go yeah. out and buy a ton of gear. You have to go into OBS and code your own overlays <laughs> and you have to... There's yeah. like all these things that is not really about what we're doing. Like we want to show like the story of creating with the tool. Yeah. Like that is, that is what we're doing. We are not, yeah. you know, we're not trying to showcase that we are the bestest producers in the world of, you yeah. know, filmatic, whatever. And I think that has scared away a lot of people that I think would be interesting to hear from, especially these, mm -hmm. again, like founding engineers that we want to reach because they then often feel like, oh, I'm not interesting enough. I don't have that I'm not setup. not a streamer. Yeah. I'm not a streamer. Like, I'm not, like, cool or I'm not this or that. But, like, those are the people that I would love to hear more from. And I don't mm -hmm. need them to go out and buy an A, Sony, X, blah. I just need them to use <laughs> the camera on their yeah. their computer. They can even just use AirPods or even the, the, the microphones on the MacBooks now are, are really good. And really good, yeah. Really good. And that's all that's kind of all you need. Like you don't need all of this other stuff because if you have yeah. interesting engineering knowledge, 
-hmm. then that is that is interesting in itself like yeah. you don't it's yeah it's valuable and it's tangible as well yes yeah. yeah and i um, i i, I want to hear from i want to hear more from them um and i'll also help them like share share their their knowledge yeah. and their passion often because like if you're an engineer turned founder you have a passion for that space you you True. don't just create another database because you're like wanting to make millions there there's something happened to you that made you want to make another database yeah. service <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's definitely true. Um, anyways, we've we've come up on time. Do you have yes, any last Yes, sorry, words I'm like blah blah blah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we promised. Uh, we were delivered on your promise of like amazing Devrel uh, knowledge, yeah. but we talked this, a lot about this was great. Though, yeah, I think this was great. I feel like anyone looking to get into Devrel consulting, at least they could reach out to you. Um, what's the best way to reach out to you? Right the best me. way is to DM me on Twitter or LinkedIn. But my okay. website is Queen Ray Codes right there yeah. on the bottom of the screen. Um, yeah, that's that's great then. Um, anyways, thank you very much, Queen, for coming on today. And I have so many other questions. I actually have all the questions, <laughs> like all the questions I put together. I didn't ask any of them. <laughs> so, We'll have well, to we, redo this. <laughs> maybe we should just do another one next week, and that's the one you release. This is like when it's uh, rambling about the things that interest her, and then we can yeah. come to get to your questions the next time. This one is already released since it's live, so we'll have to like oh, schedule live, another yeah. one. So we have to get, yeah. <laughs> and go on and go on for another hour again. But anyways, thank you so much for for coming on the stream. Um, really thank you for having this. me. Yeah, and for anyone listening, thanks for for tuning in. Um, this is recorded on. YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter, so you can always rewatch this. And until next time, have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, keep building. Cheers. Keep building, yes.